Welcome back to This Week in Immigration, the Bipartisan Policy Center's regular deep look at the latest immigration news and the policy behind it. I'm Hannah Tyler, research analyst for BPC's Immigration Project, still filling in for Blake Johnson, who is out on parental leave. In this week's episode, we're discussing immigration in the workforce. Teresa Cardinal-Brown, BPC's Managing Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy, will be joined by Jason Fickner, Vice President and Chief Economist at BPC, to give an overview of labor and workforce trends. He has significant government experience, having served in several positions at the Social Security Administration, as Senior Economist with the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress, and as an economist with the Internal Revenue Service. Julia Gillette, Senior Policy Analyst at the Migration Policy Institute, focusing on the legal immigration system, demographic trends, and the implications of local, state, and federal U.S. immigration policy, will then join to discuss immigration's specific impact on the workforce and labor trends. Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. We're happy to have with us today BPC's chief economist and all-around economic guru, Jason Fickner. Uh, You can find him and follow him on Twitter at JJ Fickner, and we are very happy to have him. Welcome, Jason. Thank you for having me, Teresa. So, Jason, we are here to talk today about the labor force, the workforce in the United States, the population of people working or looking for work and its impact on the economy. And this has been in the news a lot. Uh, Recently, we've seen a lot of headlines about uh, labor market shortages and employers unable to find jobs. And this is as we're recovering from what was essentially a COVID-induced recession and and large unemployment. But let's just sort of get a big picture here. What What are the trends that we've seen in the labor market and the workforce since the advent of COVID? Well, I I think it's important, again, to keep in mind how disruptive COVID has been. I don't think we need to tell anybody that, but it's important to sort of bring that back up because as we're thinking about what's going on with the employment levels, the participation rates, employers not being able to find jobs, supply chain issues, all of these still focus around the fact that we're coming out of a pandemic, which was very disruptive, not just for the U.S., but for global markets in general. And, And that's sort of the context with which we have to talk about this because there are a few things that are happening. One, you might have heard about this great resignation, right? Where people are leaving the labor market. They're done, they're tired, they're going. We're seeing roughly, you know, two million, two and a half million, million two and a half million more retirees than we expected. There's a trend line you can follow for those who are turning roughly 65, those who are 55 plus who might decide to leave the labor force. And you can draw a pretty consistent trend for the last few years. We're over two million more than we expected. We're also seeing about 2.5 million people less in the labor force now, even with a low unemployment rate, than we had pre-pandemic. So some people left the labor force because they're just worried about COVID. They could have child care issues. They may be being self-employed and not reporting it yet. So there's a lot of issues going on. And this sort of leads to what goes forward as we come out of it and what are we seeing and why are things still persistently sort of stuck? And I think we need to talk about what might be called now the Great Reset. We're going to reset from all this. What are we seeing happening? We have now discovered after two years of COVID that many of our jobs we can do from home. Most employers said, there's no way you can work from home. You're not going to be productive. You're not going to get work done. All you're going to do is streaming and watching movies all day. We now know that isn't true. But we also know that for many industries and various sectors, they can't work from home. So you still have a lot of people who have to come in who are quote unquote essential workers And that could be your grocery workers, your hospital workers, your daycare workers, hospitality service, food industries. They still have to come in. And and that's created sort of this divergence in the labor market where now how do you respond? Uh, Another trend is employers are starting to figure out whether they can do some jobs with automation as opposed to individuals to try to keep up productivity. And then as part of this great reset, Teresa, we're going to start seeing what happens with our city centers and our core. We've you know, there's been a lot of commercial real estate over the last several years built to house workers who may not be coming into the office anymore. What happens to that city core? The businesses that support it, the dry cleaners, the restaurants, the bars, the, you know, the, the markets um, that are relying on people coming into work. If we don't come to work in the office, what happens to those buildings, those workers, those businesses? There's going to be some reshuffling going on and we're seeing that playing out right now. So you you talked a little bit about the trends that we're seeing now. I mean, maybe it's hard to predict, but do you think some of those trends are going to continue or are we kind of still waiting to see what post-COVID work life and workforce uh, participation will look like? 
Yeah, it's, it's that old joke that, you know, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. And I think we are seeing that now, too. I think we are going to see some trends that were happening now continue. So for one, for example, is I do think we're going to see some combination of work from home continue. The, the idea that everyone's going to have to go back into the office five days a week on a consistent nine to five or nine to six work schedule, I think, is over. We are seeing employees demand more flexibility. We're seeing employers give more flexibility. We're seeing that employers have to. Uh, just trying to hire people. We've seen some issues at the Bipartisan Policy Center. We've tried to hire some people and we've lost some candidates because they found out we want people to come back to work two or three days a week once the pandemic's over. And they're like, nope, we're not doing it, which is surprising, but maybe it's not surprising. This trend is going to continue and people might start trying to work remotely on a permanent basis. This is going to be some reset and some reshuffling going on. But I think the trend is there's going to be a balance that has to go between completely work from home and completely back in the office and we're going to find some sort of balance in between. And I do think we're going to see some industries with wage gains that have happened, again, in hospitality, construction, uh, healthcare, that are going to persist and, and keep up for a while. I know they're coming back down, but we're going to see wage gains hold. What I'm looking forward to is seeing what happens is whether inflation gets tamed or not. Uh, you know, a year ago when we started talking about inflation, I thought it was going to be temporary. It's lasted a lot longer than I thought. But part of this is looking at the statistics of supply chain and who's been out of the workforce. At one point late last year, about 9 million people were out of the workforce because they were sick at various one point in time because of COVID. Presumably we'll come out of that and those people start coming back into the workforce. And once we get a stable number of workers who are coming into these industries, that should help lift some of the supply chain issues, uh, which should bring down inflation as well. At the same time, though, we are seeing these consistent reports of workforce shortages in many industries, especially in the last year or so. And a lot of those are in the industries that you talked about that are, you know, where people can't work remotely or, or need to come in. What do you think are some of the things that are causing those those labor difficulties? I mean, you mentioned sort of fewer people in the workforce overall, but what, what do you what else do you think is could be causing it? And what do you think are, are the solutions uh, that are being put forward to ease some of those? And again, keep in mind, when we talk about this, COVID has to be first and foremost in our discussion, our narrative framework, because COVID results in all these workplace shortages, the disruptions to global supply chain. Again, roughly 9 million people at the end of December were out because they had COVID or COVID-related illnesses or caring for somebody who had COVID. So think about now a production cycle, right, where someone's got to come into work to work at a manufacturing, whether it's chocolate milk, automobiles, lumber. People have to show up for work. If they don't show up because they're sick or caring for a loved one who has COVID, then that supply stops, right? That production stops and you get a supply chain disruption. Think about China. China has gone really heavy on lockdowns uh, to try to control the spread of coronavirus. Those lockdowns lead to supply chain shortages for computer chips. And computer chips go into everything we use from the phone that you have in your hand all the time you're talking on to the computer, to your automobiles, to televisions, to washer and dryers. All these things are now backlogged because of supply chain issues. So when we think about the disruptions, you've got to think first and foremost about the workers who've been disrupted because of COVID and the lockdowns that are a result of this. And then once those free up, we're going to start seeing some supply chain issues come back on, but it's going to take a while to get through the backlog. So first and foremost, that's been one of the shortage issues. The second has been some of the government stimulus payments we've seen in the U.S. Um, the U.S. had a really rapid and vigorous response to COVID by helping people stay attached to the labor force, either through the Paycheck Protection Program for employers or through enhanced unemployment insurance if they got laid off or through government stimulus. That kept savings up and consumption up. Those dollars were still trying to buy goods, which are now being limited because of COVID and workforce shortages. That led to inflation. So the solutions are short term and long term. Short term, we need to get people back to work, right? We need to get COVID under control. Everyone should get vaccinated, get back to work. We're starting to see that happen. Governors have been lifting mask mandates. Uh, here in the District of Columbia, ours is going to end uh, the 28th of February. And, you know, hopefully that now leads back to normalcy. We get normalcy, people back to work, supply chains free up. We'll start seeing this happen. Long term, though, we need to start planning ahead. And that means more robust supply chains needs to have more computer chip factories that are built in the U.S., not overseas, thinking about expanding our port rail and infrastructure systems, and the recently passed infrastructure bill should help with that, and we're going to have additional workforce automation. But those are things that are going to take years to build. The short-term solution is getting people back to work, getting people vaccinated, and getting through, or at least learning to live with, COVID. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the long-term trends. You started off by saying that one of the things that COVID accelerated was the retirement of older people out of the workforce. I mean, this is a long-term demographic trend that we knew was coming, right? The baby boomers are retiring and leaving the workforce. They are the largest generation that are currently living. Well, I guess millennials have now taken over. But that that has accelerated. I mean, how do you see the demographic and population trends in the United States impacting the workforce? This is a great question. When thinking about population trends, and demographics, it's birth, deaths, immigration, and aging of the population. So let's let's go with births first, because everyone's happy about births. That makes people excited. It's not as gloomy as <laughs> yeah. deaths, right? So births, were, we have about 10,000 babies born in the U.S. every day. That's a nice number, it really is. It's also about the same number of people who are turning 65 every day. So people turning 65 and babies being born are roughly the same. And of course, the workers, when they retire, they leave. Babies don't start working right away. We'd kind of like them to start working at two, but they don't really seem to have confidence <laughs> for a while. That's not good. So it's yeah. not good. So, so this is sort of happening with births and the birth rate per women is declining. Uh, so it's about 1.7 you know, babies per, per woman. For a replacement rate to equal, we need to be about 2, 2.1. So we're seeing a decline in infertility in the United States. About 3 million people die every year in the U.S. And, and then this starts going to the aging of the population. What do we see happening? So again, there's 10,000 people turning 65 every day. We're coming up to what I call the peak 65 moment, which is in 2024, 12,000 people a day will turn age 65. Now go to 2030. 2030 is going to be a very interesting demographic shift for us. So we're only eight years away from this. In, in 2030, that marks the point where baby all baby boomers will be older than 65. So the baby boomers are now in the retirement age, and one in five people in this country will then be of retirement age. That's going to put a lot of fiscal pressure on the United States because our age, our workers to retiree ratio is going to be declining. We're going to have increased costs for health care, Social Security, et cetera. And we're also going to see the point where right around 2030, even as immigration levels, if they stay constant, we're going to have basically immigration take over natural births when it comes to our population in the United States. So we start thinking about natural births, natural deaths, immigration, we'll have more immigration on net than we will have from population growth of the U.S. population by natural birth. 2030 is going to be a very fascinating year for us. That's and that's not, as you mentioned, that's that's not that far away. I mean, no. we, we are an immigration podcast, but I, I just want to talk about so looking at that future you already mentioned one economic impact of sort of a, a, a shrinking labor force and aging population which is the worker to retiree ratio because social security and a lot of our government pl- uh, programs are based on current workers funding current retirees right so it's not like you bank away a bunch of money for your own future retirement no you know your your grandkids are paying for your retirement and just like you know I'm paying for my grandparents retirement or whatever but what other economic consequences are there if we don't do something to kind of address this this trend? Uh, you know, if we see a continually shrinking workforce or, you know, our, our aging population, what what other economic consequences are there to this 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 demographic projection? Well, you have less innovation for one. I mean, the idea of having more people competing with each other is you get more innovation, more growth and more productivity. So a declining labor force if you have an increasing you know, consumer base, right? So again, the elderly, if they retire, they're not out of the population. They are now consumers. You need more people working to provide for those people who are consuming. So you need to produce more goods. We have to keep up the productivity. So the only way to do that is either have more workers or have a lot faster growth in productivity or a combination of the two. So by not having enough immigrants coming in, bringing in their talents, their experiences, their competition, their drive, we basically could get to the point where we start stagnating on innovation growth um, and what that means for technological advancement. And that could be a really sort of great stagnation point for the U.S. if we don't start taking this seriously and start thinking about our workforce development more holistically, education, immigration, et cetera. I mean, you mentioned that sort of ambiguous term productivity, right? Like that's another thing that economists have noted is that our productivity growth has not been as great in recent years as it had been sort of uh, maybe in the in the last twenty, where we saw significant innovations, particularly technology innovations like the things that allow us to work remotely now, you know how how does that play into this? It plays in significantly, but there's always a debate about productivity when we start thinking about what are the big, the great inventions we're talking about, right? So you have the elevator allowed us to build skyscrapers, uh, you know, computers allowed us to be more productive, word processors. I don't, you know, the internet. 
I don't. When's the last time you stepped into a library and went to the stacks? Uh, how many people who are listening to this podcast know what the Dewey Decimal System is for a card catalog? <laughs> now you just yeah. Google everything. I mean, Google's a verb and a noun. And, and that productivity is there, but sometimes it's hard to capture. And some of the R&D we start working on when it comes to intellectual capacity and co- is hard to measure. But you start thinking about what are the great inventions? We still don't have flying cars yet. I mean, we think about the yeah. idea of what's going to improve our lives. You have health care that could be massive improvements. We haven't cured cancer yet. Uh, you think about transportation. We don't have the flying car or teleportation devices, so we're still stuck in traffic. Um, those things haven't improved. Air travel, we've gotten a lot more fuel efficient when it comes to air travel, but it hasn't gotten any faster. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's gotten slower from the recent delays I've had taking air travel. <laughs> so I'm concerned that we don't have that sort of productivity where you can produce more things per worker, and then the innovation that comes with creativity. And, and one of the things about the United States, which I do think is the best country in the world for innovation, is we have property rights, we have protection, we let people, we have patent protections, we let people keep their innovations. And that's why so many people want to come here, because it's it still is the place of the American dream of old. And we have to make sure we continue to have policies in place that encourage people to seek their own fortune and that we promote innovation and growth and get the best and the brightest to come here and share their talents with us. And, and to that effect, the Washington Post uh, editorial board recently had an op-ed where they essentially said, we need more immigrants and more babies uh, to combat the stagnating population growth. Um, and and they, they say the same thing you do, that high, uh, high population growth has been an engine of prosperity in the United States for a long time. And, and they, they warn of that. Um, you know, we saw recently the, um, the Biden administration has uh, reformed some policies around STEM immigration. We see Congress is, is now taking up this idea of competitiveness with China um, and immigration may be part of that. I, do you think, and you sort of mentioned this earlier, but, but how important is immigration to addressing pieces of this? It, it, it's very important. And as you know, listeners from our other BPC podcast know, when I'm off, often asked an economic question, the best answer is it depends. And I'm going to give that same answer here. You know, what does it mean to have more immigration? Is one person more than we've had last year more? Technically, yes. Uh, is 10 million more, a billion more? Yes. But where where is the smart growth? So I think we start talking about immigration. We need to talk about smart immigration. What does that mean? And, and again, it means having still robust borders that, you know, are, are secure. So we're not worried about criminal activity. And you can't, once you get secure borders, you also need to have you know, something you and I have talked about previously, you need to have the administrative capacity to process legal immigration and visas. And if you don't have that capacity, people then look for other means to get here. So we need to have a robust system that actually has an administrative capacity to process legal immigration and visas, have secure borders, and then have smart immigration policies where you have policymakers, corporations, all working together to get the best and smartest people here who want to be a part of the American system, want to work, want to contribute, and again, bring their talents here. And, and then for child uh, rearing and child, child care is expensive. So I don't have children. I always make a joke that children are reverse ATMs. They suck money out of your wallet. <laughs> and anyone who's a parent is probably nodding their head or laughing going, yes, children are expensive. So that, this is one of those demographic changes that's done too. So, you know, our, our parents were, my, my parents were two earner incomes. My grandparents, that generation is different, right? The, the days of being a one earner parent are likely over in some ways. It's just too expensive. So what does that mean we have to do for sort of policies? And this goes into thinking about childcare or, or universal pre-K, but we also need to make sure we do things targeted. You don't want to have government benefits like child tax credits going to people who don't need them or who make too much money. So let's think about how we can target it for fiscal responsibility reasons. But we do have to consider the cost of what it means to raise children and figure out ways to sort of mitigate those costs in some ways so we can encourage population growth through fertility and also, again, have smart immigration. Yeah. So so immigration can help now and dealing with our fertility and, and how expensive it is to child is a longer term prospect um, to, to, to address the economic consequences. And I think immigration is also a longer term issue, right? You, 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 yeah. this, this country has been, you know, in, unless you are of Native American descent, uh, this country, you know, basically has been prospering because of all the immigrants coming in, whether it's been, you know, for your first generation, second or third. I'm, you know, descendant of immigrants who came from Europe, uh, you know, fleeing persecution or wanted a better life, so they came here. And, and I think that is a long term thing that the United States needs to keep as a culture to attract, again, the best and brightest talent the world has to offer. We want them here. 
um, we need to make sure this is a welcoming and encouraging place for them. Well, with that, I think we'll end it there. Jason Fickner, thanks so much for being on This Week in Immigration. My pleasure, Teresa. Thank you. We're joined now by Julia Jalat, Senior Policy Analyst at the Migration Policy Institute. Uh, she is an expert on all things immigration, particularly in the United States, and you can find her on Twitter at J underscore Jalat. Welcome, Julia. Thanks for having me. So um, we have heard earlier in this podcast from BPC's economist, Jason Fickner, who talked sort of broadly about the importance of a workforce in our broader economic prosperity in this country and sort of some trends and demographic trends. But I want to talk to you specifically about how immigrants fit into all of this. So what is our nation's history of immigration meant for our labor force and our workforce, uh, both kind of historically and currently? Over the the 1990s and the early 2000s, we were taking in about a million immigrants a year into the United States. And we know that most of those immigrants tend to come at prime working ages. So immigrants have been a huge driver of our labor force growth. Um, Immigrants and their children, you know, since 2000 have been driving over half of the growth in the U.S. labor force. So immigration has been such a source of strength for our workforce and our economy. Um, And as, you know, the U.S. population starts to age. We're seeing growth in our in our older population and the retiring of the baby boom generation. Um, immigrants and their children are becoming even more important in sustaining that labor force growth. In fact, all of the growth now of our working age population is coming from immigrants and their children. Wow, that's that's a that's pretty substantial. Um, so. What do studies say about the particular contributions of immigrants in the workforce? Where where are they concentrated in the workforce? What kind of jobs or occupations? Yeah, we rely on immigrants really in so many sectors of our labor force from, you know, we see in the tech industry, for example, but also farm workers and lower skilled workers. Uh, during the pandemic, I think it became really clear how much we rely on immigrants in some of our you know, essential jobs that kept all of us alive and healthy and kept our economy going. Um, Just to give some examples, you know, immigrants are 17% of the overall labor force in the United States, but, you know, made up 37% of home health care aides, 29% of physicians, um, 20% of surgeons, 22% of workers in food industries are immigrants. So immigrants play a big role in meat processing and agriculture and transportation of food products. And, you know, in some states, immigrants really are the majority of the workforce. You know, immigrants are over two thirds of agricultural workers in California. They're two thirds of meat processors in Nebraska, where some of us get our steaks from. And there are 70% of seafood processing workers in Alaska. So you know, all of us are really highly dependent on immigrant workers for our kind of day-to-day living. You know, you said that traditionally in the 90s and early 2000s, we accepted over a million new immigrants a year. Where are we now? Uh, we understand that COVID has tri- kind of driven down those numbers, but what effect has the maybe lower rates of immigration had on, of the last five years on the labor force? Yeah, even before COVID, we saw that immigration was slowing down. So over the past 10 years, it's been more like half a million immigrants coming in per year on average. And then, of course, you know, during COVID, we saw such slowdowns in visa processing um, and visa issuances were cut in half and they're still, you know, far below their normal level. This, we think, is, you know, one of the contributors to the labor shortages that we're seeing in the United States right now. There's really tight labor markets in certain parts of the country and certain industries and having that shortfall in immigration is likely a contributing factor to that. You know, it remains to be seen how much our agencies can get back on board and start processing those visas again and increasing immigration levels this year. They seem to be working really hard to do that, but we're, you know, down a lot of immigrant workers that we would have seen otherwise, if not for the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned some of the industries that immigrants are really heavily in, but some of those are industries that saw a lot of job losses early in the pandemic. How has sort of the employment rate of immigrants related to those of native-born workers throughout the COVID time? 
Immigrant workers saw higher unemployment during the worst of the pandemic. So, you know, in April 2020, when unemployment rates peaked, we saw that immigrants had unemployment rates several points higher than the U.S. born. Um, And immigrant women in particular were hard hit by job losses. Um, They had the higher unemployment rates than immigrant men, than U.S. born workers for most of the past two years. Um, And the reason for this is that immigrant workers tend to be concentrated in parts of the country that had higher unemployment rates. They also tend to work in parts of the economy that were harder hit. So, you know, immigrant women work in particular in service industries and face to face jobs. Those are exactly the kinds of jobs that were lost during the pandemic when people were trying to, you know, social distance and stay safe from the virus. So if we are able to get back to sort of the normal rates of immigration, where where do things project in the future? I mean, you said right now, almost all of our labor force growth is coming from immigration. You know, if we're if if we can't get back up to that, even, you know, a million is, is a million a year enough for us in the future? Or do we need to look at other numbers there? It's really hard to put a specific, you know, number or target on immigration, but you know, we know that um, having a faster growing labor force is better for economic growth overall. We also know that immigration is going to be really important as we are an aging society with more seniors out of the labor force, that, with that population growing. We need more workers who can, you know, pay their taxes and contribute to the budgets that will pay for those seniors, you know, Social Security and Medicare Um, We also are going to see really strong demand for workers in the industries that support older Americans. So in, you know, healthcare industry, specifically home health care aides and and workers for nursing homes, which are seeing shortages right now, um, and all of the kinds of services that help a retiring population. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly what number, but immigration into the future is going to be really, really important for our overall economic growth. And for, you know, easing some of the strains that aging countries experience, we've seen, you know, the strains that Japan has gone through and they're starting to open up to more immigration because of that. The United States has stayed young because of our immigration and our immigrant population. But, you know, without that immigration, those strains of aging will be, you know, increasingly acute. So we need to keep an eye on uh, the our immigration system to see if it can kind of come back to processing at least the normal rate of legal immigration to the United States. I want to ask one other question because I know that our listeners are going to ask this. So we've talked about a million legal immigrants a year, but there's also been undocumented immigration. You know, how does that how does that relate to the legal immigration amounts that we've seen sort of in terms of the overall number of immigrants in the United States? A lot of people think that we've just seen a tremendous increase in undocumented migrants over the last few years because they've seen pictures at the border. Is that is that correct or are we, you know, or, or has that is that image not necessarily representative? Yeah, it's a little counterintuitive, but part of the reason we had such strong growth in our immigrant population in the 1990s and 2000s was because of people coming without authorization. Mm -hmm. Um, We saw really, really high rates of people joining the unauthorized immigrant population in the 1990s and again in the 2000s. And then when the Great Recession hit in 2007, that was really the peak size of our unauthorized immigrant population. Ever since then, it's been a pretty steady population. Um, So, you know, of course, those folks are also joining the labor force and a lot of industries are pretty dependent, we know, on unauthorized immigrant workers. Over the pandemic, we've seen, you know, with Title 42, we've seen people who come to the border be turned right around and sent back to Mexico in large numbers, um, which means that although there are high border apprehensions, there aren't nearly as many people coming into the United States and joining our population and our economy as there were during the high peaks in unauthorized immigration, you know, in 2000 and the years around then. So we're kind of hit with a double whammy, if you will, when it comes to immigration in the United States. Our legal immigration system has fallen behind because of COVID and has seen declining numbers because of processing delays and undocumented immigrants, which had also made up a pretty significant portion of, of net migration in the early part of the century, has also declined, ironically, because we're doing better at the border, if you want to put it that way. Is that true? Yeah, that's about right. Um, <laughs> even with, you know, at maybe as many people coming to the border as we've seen in some past periods, many fewer of them 
are making it into the United States, at least right now. So that's something to think about as we think about uh, where, where Congress can look at policies in the future, obviously addressing how many legal immigrants we can come we can come in right now. That's a lot about, you know, how many cases in the backlog that USCIS has and State Department has and what they can process. But then looking at, um, you know, do we need to reform our system so that number is higher so that the unauthorized population is actually brought more into the legal immigration system for the future? That's right. I mean, right now, employers in the United States would love to be able to hire some of those people who are coming to our border and getting turned away. There are industries that are just really, really hungry for workers. And we have people showing up to our border wanting to live and work in the United States. If Congress could create some legal pathways or expand legal pathways to create a match between those employers that need workers and those people who want to just come and and to earn the wages available in the United States, that would really be to everyone's benefit. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, Congress seems to find this, you know, too difficult of a topic to handle right now. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Well, Julie Gillette, thank you so much for breaking that down for us and for joining us on This Week in Immigration. We greatly appreciate You can find Julia and her work at migrationpolicy.org. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And that's it for our show this week. One last reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform, and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find more information on all the issues we discuss here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. I'm Hannah Tyler. This Week in Immigration was created and executive produced by Teresa Cardinal-Brown. This week's episode was written by Hannah Tyler, Teresa Cardinal-Brown, and Hanadi Jordan. Ethan Plotkin produces and edits our show. The executive producer of BPC Podcasts is Lucy Manning. See you next time on This Week in Immigration.